So it's a very warm welcome to the Humanity Podcast today to Cameron. How are you, Cameron? Very good, thank you. Great to be on your show. Yeah, and thanks very much for connecting. I was just saying to you off here that um, I wish my th- my show was three days long today because I could chat to you about a lot of these adventurous things that we're going to talk about. So um, whereabouts in the world are you talking to us from? I'm in Hong Kong, on Hong Kong Island, in Beaut- a tiny flat. Um, you may hear some of the traffic rumbling by. Uh, I apologize <laughs> for that. Hong Kong's a noisy place. That's okay. Have you been there long? I've been here for about 15 years. Ah, oh, it's a um, fan- so it's come home. It's a fantastic place, isn't it? It's a hive of activity, and of recent times, it's been in the news for all sorts of reasons. Uh, how are you coping with that? Yeah, um, it's been a troubling time, to say the least. Um, like I say, Hong Kong has become my home, and I uh, care deeply about it. And uh, the, the the developments in the last sort of year two years have been quite troubling um and quite disruptive to life uh hong kong is definitely going through change but it's one of these places that has changed so many times changed so drastically had uh, had kings come and go that i kind of have faith that it'll sort of keep its spirit because of what has happened in the past in, in hong kong and and that is that's sort of what shaped hong kong i guess the the uh, constant upheaval and flux of this place. So, it's a really fascinating. Hang on a minute. I've just got. <laughs> sure. So yeah, it's a real melting pot, isn't it, Hong Kong? And it's always the seen as the gateway, I guess. I guess to China, and um, you know, these days things are, are looking a little bit more um, domineering in, in that factor. As as a foreigner living there, is there um, concerns around safety and, and what the short term future holds for you guys? Um, not for me. There's not concerns. I'm not a. I'm not a working journalist anymore. I think uh, working journalists probably need to start thinking about these sort of things. Hmm. Um, and it, the crazy thing is that Hong Kong is one of these cities that you know you can send your 12 year old daughter walking through the darkest streets at three o'clock in the morning, and know that she'll be perfectly safe. Um, that's the that's been the nature of the city as long as I've known it. So this sort of change in that sort of safety uh, balance is really shocking to this city, I guess. Um, I mean, this is obviously a very different thing. Being bundled off into the mainland to a prison somewhere is quite different than being mugged on the street. But um, I think it's a city that is very accustomed to safety and security. And so um, often when we, we've been having these, you know, the street protests and the, and the police violence and, and the various things going on, uh, we look at you know news that's coming out of you know Syria or somewhere like that, and we're like, geez, we've got it pretty light here, don't we? <laughs> yeah. Um, and and we do, and still, you know, life is good here. Don't don't get me wrong. Uh, we we're still living a great life, but uh, I think it's the the nuances, uh, the the things on the fringes, the things in your mind, the mind police, that sort of stuff that is a bit troubling. Yeah, it's a great way of looking at it because we can always say, well, there's people in other parts of the world that are worse off than ourselves and uh, we've got to have that empathetic view sometimes as well. Um, yes. Moving right along, what I do on my show, Cameron, is I offer my guests the opportunity to dedicate their podcast show with me to someone special in your life. So who would you like to dedicate your show to today? You caught me. <laughs> Uh, to my 92-year-old dad. Oh, that's beautiful. What's his name? <clears throat> Sorry, can we do that one again? No, go ahead. Uh, um, yeah, I'd like to dedicate it to my 92-year-old father. He's uh, stuck in Canada. Yep. I haven't seen him for a while because of COVID. Yep. And uh, he's a man of adventure. Fantastic. What's his name? Leonard. Leonard. Leonard Dewey. Oh, that's funny. Yeah. My, my father's name was Leonard as well. There you go. So, yeah. Leonard... This is a shout out for you from Cameron today, and uh, that's a beautiful dedication, sending it out to your father. And which part of Canada is he in? Uh, in the prairies in Manitoba. Um, it's the flat part where all the wheat is grown and on the edge of the forest. It's a beautiful part of the world. Um, it's cold as, uh, well, it's very cold in <laughs> wintertime. <laughs> yeah. And uh, in summertime, it gets really hot, so it's a crazy place of contrast. And uh, yeah, I grew up on a tiny farm, 
or not. I grew up. I grew up on a on a farm on the edge of that uh, of the prairies, kind of right where the forest begins into the into the north. And it was a turkey farm, I hear. Yes. How many yeah. How many turkeys were running around? Um, I, don't, I can't remember how many there would have been when I was growing up. Now it's still in the family, and uh, my nephew runs it now. It's about I think they were around twenty thousand turkeys at the peak time of the year. Right. It's a laying farm, a turkey egg farm. Oh, okay. Uh, we produce the eggs that ha are hatched into the turkeys that you eat. What a wonderful part of the world to grow up in. Like, you know, you're outdoors, you've got some of the most spectacular nature in the world and all the rest of it. Is that, is that where the whole exploring uh, spirit came from, from that youthfulness in the yeah, place like Yeah, I that? think so. I, th I mean, I, I mentioned my father, and I think that it came from my family a lot. Uh, he, was, he really was adventurous, uh, moved us up into an area that was virgin forest, uh, our farm, where our farm was located was Virgin Forest when, when he moved there in the 1950s. And so that idea of, uh, of striking out, kind of carving your own place out, um, was really impressed upon us, I think. Mm. And um, I was the youngest of seven children, so I had a lot of time, and they were all much older than me, mm -hmm. so I had a lot of time alone. Uh, so I read a lot, and I think I explored the farm kind of on my little tricycle quite young. There's some uh, stories and pictures of me trying to escape at three years old, you know, this sort of stuff. And, and so I think, uh, yeah, given the room and the encouragement to kind of explore. So when you live in a place like that and you go to school every day and you talk to your mates about your dreams in life, what were some of the dreams that you had to uh, going through your mind at that young age? Well, I was I was a big reader, um, and I read. Uh, There's two books that really. I, I say really formed my adulthood, and uh, one of them was Papillon. Oh yeah, uh, the book about mm. the the French uh, prison uh, prisoner underworld character who did his seven escapes, and uh, another one was Midnight Express. Oh uh, yes, very and yeah. a bit, bit more tawdry perhaps, <laughs> yeah. but also a story of sort of adventure gone wrong. And <laughs> I read both of those books at an age that was probably in a bit a bit inappropriate. I snuck them off my older brother's <laughs> uh, bedside table. Yeah. And um, so uh, that really captured my imagination, um, this idea that this big world was out there. I mean, I grew up in a very sheltered uh, community, very sheltered home. I uh, went to a small school. There was only three people in my year. Oh, wow. A country school, three-room country school, three people in my year. Um, drove snowmobile to school in the wintertime. Um, and so the world felt... It was, it was kind of hard to, to imagine the world. We didn't have a TV. Yeah. Um, and so I read a lot, and those books kind of made me think, wow, there's there's a lot out there to see. The Midnight Express is a bit of a hardcore book for a young guy, yeah? <laughs> it, is, it is, yeah. <laughs> I think I was around 10 or 12 years old when I read those. And, I, yeah. I think it was one of the first movies I ever saw, actually. It was uh, something that had a big impact on me in a certain way. But uh, yeah, got me into travel as well. So... Um, when you were old enough at, at school to start thinking about a career, what what did you want to be when you grew up? I never really thought about it a lot, like because, like I say, I grew up in this community where where farming and and working sort of um, la skilled labor jobs, you know, welding, construction, house painting, um, driving heavy machinery mm -hmm. uh, in the you know maybe working on working on the highways, building highways, or, or going up north to work in the logging camps. This was what a lot of people did. This was a lot of what, what a lot of men did. Um, and so I didn't really have any, I didn't really know many people that did anything else. Um, and it wasn't until I think kind of high school when I found out that I had a, I could write. Hmm. Uh, I could write and I could I could tell stories to put it in a nice way. Um, I was I, I was known for a bit of BSing in school, I think, <laughs> and uh, and one of my teachers spotted that and and kind of encouraged me to turn that into something uh, positive. Yeah, and um, we didn't have a daily paper. We didn't get a daily paper at home. Uh, wasn't really exposed to to daily news sort of stuff. So the whole world of journalism was kind of closed to me. I didn't. I wasn't really aware of it. Mm. Um, and she pointed me in that direction. She said, think about journalism. So I actually started doing some research, what ex journalists actually did. Yeah. And uh, I thought the, the, the traveling bit, yeah. meeting people, interviewing people, 
that's what popped up to me and I said yeah that, that works out for me and so that's what I did what a fantastic teacher to embrace something that you're passionate about and put you on the track this is, yeah this is Alison <laughs> right uh, English English teacher yeah uh, are you sending her a Christmas card every year <laughs> I have spoken at the high school and thank you publicly. Very good, very good. Now, that uh, if we go fast forward a little bit, that ended up you um, actually getting into journalism, right, and starting your career, and um, you ended up in Chicago. How did that come about? I So I went to a community college to, get a, to, to learn about journalism, uh, and then um, I didn't have a lot of money. I was kind of on my own uh, trying to pay rent and stuff, and got offered a job before graduation. And I couldn't afford not to take it <laughs> right. uh, because I really was struggling to make rent. And so I actually dropped out and took the job um, and uh, worked out great. I had the job for six months and then we were stringing. I was a stringer in Winnipeg for um, International Newswires, okay. working in kind of a stringer shop. And uh, one of the Newswires offered me a job in Chicago. And if you grow up in Canada, and especially if you grow up in a small town or on the farm, Moving to the States is, uh, everybody refers to it as the States, and moving to the States is sort of the big break. It's, it's, everybody thinks everything's shiny and <laughs> the US, and it used to be that way. I'm not sure if it's still that way. Yeah. Um, so it was a no-brainer, so I moved to Chicago, and mm. uh, it was a crazy time because I was a very naive, wet-behind-the-ears uh, Mennonite farm boy yeah. moving to a big city like Chicago. Uh, and uh, I'm lucky I didn't get shot in that first year, I reckon. <laughs> right, um, right. With my first paycheck, I bought a mountain bike yeah. before I owned a bed. Right. I was sleeping in a, I, I rented a flat <laughs> and was sleeping in a sleeping bag on the hardwood floor in the flat, working my first proper, you know, <clears throat> big job. And with the first paycheck I got, I went and bought myself a fancy mountain bike <laughs> and uh, rode all over Chicago. It was getting to be winter, riding all over Chicago in the wintertime. And I came to work one day and told him, you know, I was riding through this neighborhood. It was really interesting. It was like, it, it was suddenly all black people. Yeah. And uh, it was, I said, it was, felt really different. There was these big tower blocks and, and, you know, I was kind of describing it. And it was, because I lived in a quite a uh, middle class, kind of a nice neighborhood. Yeah. Uh, and uh, they were like, what was the name of it? And I said, it's called Cabrini Green. Right. And Cabrini Green, anybody that's familiar with Chicago is yeah. one of the, was in the 19... 19- probably 70s to 90s or something like that. It was one of the um, most vo- violent, gangster, uh, poorest hoods. gangster <laughs> yeah. areas, uh, projects. And I'd been bicycling around in Cabrini <laughs> Green, uh, wondering at how exotic it felt. And so that just shows how naive I really was at that time. But isn't that brilliant, though? That's all part and parcel of, you know, growing up and evolving and also being naive to things that are going on in the world, right? Like, you know, we did, you didn't have fear about it at the time. Yeah, exactly. Till you, and, till uh, you found the, out about it, I guess. <laughs> that's the beauty of it. That's the spirit that I try to capture when I travel still. I mean, maybe not quite as stupid, but um, <laughs> trying to just kind of keep my eyes open and and uh, judgments aside a little bit. Um, and I think also, I'm a big believer when you travel, if you make yourself vulnerable uh, in terms of if you leave yourself open to opportunity and, and open to have people helping you, then they will help you and, and people are incredibly nice to you when you're traveling you know if you're traveling solo and they can see you need help generally people are going to be very nice to you um yeah. yep and i always say that you know a guy stepping out the front door of the hilton uh there's not many people going to stop by and say can we help you sir mm. um mm. but if you're broken down beside the road with a motorcycle um that's when you really start seeing the kindness of strangers yeah, it's funny, isn't it, how humanity reacts to those that are more vulnerable? But I guess it's a case of making it relatable, and we can we can be in that other person's shoes pretty quickly, can't we? When we all need a bit of help. Yeah, I mean, it can go both ways. There's also people that prey on the vulnerable. Hmm. Um, but my my experience is that overwhelmingly, people will help you if you're vulnerable. Yeah, yeah, true. Now, when you're in Chicago, is that when you got into sailing? Yeah. Um, I, would, I was new there. I didn't know anybody. Um, was living near the lake in the north 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 end of the city, and uh, wandered down to the lake and um, down to the beach. Quite soon after I moved there, I was wa- hanging out on the beach and I saw all these dinghies uh, being sailed and all these pretty girls in bikinis doing the teaching. Uh, all these you know <laughs> kind of university age. And I was only twenty one, 
2021. Oh, it was a no-brainer. So thought, it was a no-brainer then. <laughs> I thought, there's a sport for me. Uh, I've never been terribly athletic, never been uh, – uh, I mean, I played the sports and stuff, but never really was good at any sports. And um, I tried it, and uh, the, the instructors were all making fun of me the rest of the day because – when I came in, apparently the top half of my head nearly fell off. I was smiling, and I, I, I just knew it. As soon as I was on the boat, it just felt incredibly natural to me. Yeah. It felt so good. Mm. And uh, so I spent that first summer, uh, every weekend, sailing. I took all the courses they offered all the way up, you know, all the levels I could get, it, get that first summer. Yeah. And then the next summer, they asked me if I wanted to start teaching beginners. Right. And so that was great. So I worked at the Chicago Board of Trade as a finance reporter yeah. uh, during, the, during the week. And on the weekends, I'd hang out on the beach teaching sailing. And uh, yeah, that's where I started sailing. Needless to say, we know which one you enjoyed the most out of those two jobs. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I'm still working in that both worlds, I guess. <laughs> Pretty interesting piece of water, Lake Michigan, isn't it? Did you have some uh, hairy moments out there in your little dinghy? Yeah, it is interesting. It's I often say that Chicago is it's a bit like Miami in the summertime because mm. uh, it has this huge beach, um, long beach. Um, yeah, the, the lake is interesting. It's it's uh, it gets a lot of weather for a lake, and uh, we were always quite close to shore and sailing little uh, Hobie cats and, and and skiffs and stuff. So generally stayed out of trouble, but had a lot of fun and, and really learned to love sailing. In, 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 es- in essence, it's a good place to learn, isn't it? When you get, you know, ch- variable conditions, but you're that close to shore that, you know, everything is pretty much easy as far as, uh, you know, getting to safety when you need to. Yeah, and there's no tides. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that, that's always a big thing, isn't it? <laughs> when you're talking about boats. So how long did you stay in Chicago for? I was in Chicago for about three years. Mm-hmm. Um, and then uh, the, so I was working for what was then called Night Raider Financial. Uh, it was a, international newswire service and uh they got bought up by some private fund and turned into bridge news uh and then uh they offered me a job in new york so oh. i wanted to transfer to new york okay and so i moved to new york city yeah brilliant uh, which was a big shock all over again <laughs> uh, before we get on to talking about new york i want to know how long were you into your three-year stint in chicago before you bought a bed for your apartment I never did. You didn't? Uh, ah. No. Somebody gave me a pull-out couch. Okay. Uh, and I spent all my money on, on, on good things, on traveling, on bicycles, on, um, you know, liberally spread it around the local bars. Uh, yeah, I had a great time, and, and uh, I didn't accumulate a lot of furniture in Chicago. I mean, I was 21 years old, and beds and sofa sets didn't really figure very large in my value system at that time. So did you get um, any of the sailing girls back to the apartment at all? Did, did the plan work out? <laughs> the sailing the sailing served its purpose. <laughs> <laughs> very diplomatically put. Very, very good. New York City, they say that everybody should live there once in their lifetime. Um, it's an incredible yeah. place. And as you say, going from Chicago to New York is a bit of like going from the frying pan into the fire, I guess, in a lot of respects. Um, how did you enjoy your time in New York? I loved it. I absolutely loved it. I think it was really good that I lived in Chicago before I moved to New York mm. uh, because I think Chicago, three years in Chicago allowed me to kind of uh, explore the world a little bit, kind of, kind of uh, find my feet. Um, not to overemphasize it, but I, I, I grew up pretty sheltered, mm. um, and so there was a lot of things that I needed to learn as a young man, and um, and so by the time I moved to New York, uh, I had a bit of swagger in my step and felt a bit more confident about living in a big city. I'd learned to use public transport, which I'd never used in my life before I moved to New York, uh, Chicago, mm-hmm. and. Um, yeah, and so I loved I loved New York, and New York is where I got into so into uh, uh, ocean sailing, mm-hmm. um, sailing keel boats. Okay, uh, never, you know I hadn't really been on keel boats in Chicago. Mm-hmm. Got into New York, got got into keel boats, got into racing for the first time. Um, did my first sort of offshore trip from Bermuda. I delivered a boat back from Bermuda to New York after the Newport Bermuda race. Okay, and. Um, so that was my first time at open sea, and uh, it was splendid, absolutely splendid. It was just blew me away, and uh, as as it as it should be, I, you know, we arrived a day. I think it was a day late or something like that, and I had family coming into New York for a visit, family coming up from Canada, 
or down from Canada. And I, so I told my girlfriend, I said, you know, I think we'll be back, you know, Saturday night or whatever. And, and my family was arriving on, on Sunday morning or something like this. And of course we were, you know, weather and, and so forth. And we were a day late. And, uh, my girlfriend was very unfamiliar with the sailing world and uh, certainly, you know, offshore sailing and stuff. So she immediately called the Coast Guard <laughs> right. and said that I think my, my boyfriend is lost at sea. And uh, we were, you know, we were fine. And, and they, I think they asked a few details and realized we were probably just a day late or whatever. And, and uh, so that was, it just made it all, it made me, it made me feel like a, a superhero when I finally landed ashore and everybody was worrying about me and ah, oh, nah, it was no problem. We're just at sea, you know. The ah, oh, the wind shifted a bit, you know. You know. So I had a story to tell. Yeah, uh, but you, great. you had it all under control the whole time. You knew exactly what you were doing and where you were, right? Yeah. One thing. <laughs> one thing that did go wrong. We had bought cases of. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been to Bermuda, but the drink, uh, the national drink there, is dark and stormy. So. Yep. Yeah. And they sell them in tin cans, mm -hmm. uh, pre-mixed in tin cans. Uh, so it's a rum and ginger beer and lemon drink. And um, we bought cases of this stuff <laughs> and packed it into the into the bilges. Oh right, we've been drinking. We've been drinking. Bermuda loved it so much. We're like, oh, we got to bring this stuff home. Yeah. And so we bought cases of it and put it into the bilges. And it was a pretty rough crossing. <laughs> and in the shifting and so forth, as tin cans are wont to do. A whole lot of them started opening up, oh. and we heard our bilge pump running all the time. Like, what the heck's going on? And we smelled this. It smells really sweet. I mean, there's like some smell going on here. Yeah. Opened up the. Like, we'd screwed the floorboards down, open them all up, <laughs> and we're like the bilges were were running with uh, with dark and stormies. <laughs> Did you get down with some straws and start licking it all up? <laughs> It was tempting, but I think we resisted. <laughs> so where did you where did you start sailing in New York City? Did you go out to Newport and places? Did you? Um, started in City Island. Um, okay. Joined a, a family uh, racing team mm. on a lovely boat called Sunshine, a, a, an Italian American family, still friends with them. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, racing out of City Island. Yeah, raced Long Island, the Long Island Sound. Yeah. You know, there's tons of racing in there. Yeah. And uh, went up to Newport, I think once or twice for different regattas, maybe. Yeah. Um, Block Island, some places like that. Um, had a great time. Yeah. Do you remember your first night out on a on a boat? I don't know if I remember our first one. I remember a few. I remember one. <clears throat> we um, so the uh, Sunshine was a Santana thirty thirty, which is a very light West Coast boat, um, thirty foot boat, kind of a family cruiser racer sort of thing. And um, so you needed to have some weight on the way on the rail. If there was mm. any weather, you needed weight on the rail to make make it go. Mm. And uh, we were shorthanded. There was a weekend race coming up. Uh, we were, it was a, I think a seventy miler or something like that. And um, so it was going to be kind of afternoon, overnight, arriving in the morning kind of thing, mm. up up and down the Long Island Sound. And um, we we were short on crew. And so the skipper asked me. He goes, "Do you know of anybody that want to come along just as rail meat?" And um, <laughs> So I rounded up two of my friends, um, one of whom was uh, uh, a guy from Nova Scotia, uh, Canada, Irish guy. So he thought he knew a lot about sailing purely because he was Irish. Right. Uh, <laughs> although he'd never been on a boat. And an Egyptian girl uh, who was the girlfriend of a good mate of mine. And I'd called the house asking, planning to ask my mate, and he was out busy with something. She said, oh, it's a shame. I guess you need one of the guys. I said, no, you're welcome to come. <laughs> so she came. So I, and um, so we had the two of them out there, and it ended up blowing as a, a, a bit more than we had expected, and so you know the, it was a bit rough. And um, it was the Egyptian girl. Her name's Dahlia. Dahlia. I won't say her full name. Uh, Dahlia, her name is Dahlia, and she was absolutely terrified that she was begging me to get her to shore. Right. And I said, "There's absolutely no way we can do that. I mean, we're in the middle of a race." And she says, can't you get them to send a helicopter for me? <laughs> and uh, and uh, She was enjoying it that much, huh? <laughs> yeah, and Donald, Donald, the Irish-Canadian guy, he was sent down for sandwiches at one point to bring sandwiches up. And it was dark, and they'd had a whole bunch of sandwiches made up, and it was written on the sandwich, on the wrappers what they were, but he was just kind of handing them out. It was, it was raining. And uh, Dahlia started you know, biting, and she was, she was a Muslim girl from, from Egypt. Yeah. And she started eating the sandwich, 
And she also goes, this tastes really funny. And she turns a torch on. She's looking at it and she goes, is this pork? And and the best line of the entire trip was Donald's shock and horror and looking around. And he goes, am I going to your hell or mine? <laughs> um, <laughs> Good adventure on Long Island Sound. <clears throat> Indeed, yeah. So what did you love the most about living in New York City? The music. I mean, there were, the sailing was amazing, but I really got into jazz and, and going to see live music. I uh, really loved it. And that's what the, it's a sad thing now, what's happening in New York. That's mm. the lifeblood of the city in many ways. Mm. Um, yeah, I loved the music, loved the, the culture. Um, got into going to museums and all that sort of stuff. And, and New York has so much of that and, and theater and, and really uh, got to spread my wings a bit and explore the world through, through that way. Was it, a tough, the arts. was it a tough city to live in? They say it's a hard city to live in. I didn't find it so, no. I mean, I was young. I was working in a newsroom, international newsroom, people from all around the world mm. working there. Mm. Uh, everybody was kind of in their 20s and early 30s. And so um, we were all out partying together on the weekends. And, and no, I didn't find it hard to live in at all. Uh, I, I loved it. I, I lived in a tiny, tiny studio flat. Um, again, spent all my money kind of going out and exploring and traveling and stuff like this. And the great thing was from New York, uh, international flights to anywhere in the world, really. Yep. And so this was back in the day when you could flip open the New York Times, you go to the back pages of the New York Times, the, the classifieds, and they'd be advertising flights. They're called buck, uh, they were like flight bucket shops or something like that they were called. And they would do like, you have to fly within the next seven days kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, and you get these super cheap flights to all kinds of places around the world. So I did some really fun trips that way. Mm, brilliant. And uh, did you have a bed in your apartment in New York? A beard? Bed. 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 <laughs> um, yes. I, I. No, actually, no. I still used a futon. Oh, I used uh, a futon. Okay. I'm just my phone here. I don't know if you could hear that. Um yeah, I had a. I you know when I got to New York, uh, I bought a futon, uh, uh, used off of uh, I think the Village Voice. Um, uh, there was no room for a bed; it had to serve both purposes. <laughs> Do you think you ever go back to New York City to live again? I would love to. Mm. If I ever went back to the U.S., um, it would be New York. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's such um, a great I, place. New York is such an interesting place because I mean, it's it's everything about America on on steroids but it's it's so non-american as well mm, um mm. it's this kind of dichotomy of being of being the, the worst and the best of america i think mm. yeah so what did you do after you uh had your time in new york where did you go next um i got uh i got a job with uh reuters in singapore mm. and um all my friends told me that i wouldn't like singapore uh because it was too straight laced too buttoned down um, but at the time, my um, the Bridge News was shutting down, and so we were fleeing like rats fleeing a ship. <laughs> and uh, so um, I got offered a job in Singapore covering oil, uh, writing about oil, and so I jumped at it. And uh, yeah, it was cool. It was my first time in Asia. I'd never been, never even traveled in Asia before. Yeah. And uh, so it was an, another great adventure, another place to explore. Um, ended up. I enjoyed Singapore, but it, mostly because it was an easy place to get out of hmm. on the weekends and hmm. uh, for holidays. Hmm. Uh, and had a, yeah, did did a lot of sailing as well. Again in Singapore, got into scuba diving and and loving the ocean and stuff. And uh, yeah, had a lot of fun. Changi Sailing Club or East Coast? Where were you? Uh, Changi, Changi, Changi. Okay, yeah. Yeah. yeah, top of the island, out near the airport. Um, best airport in the world. Just been. Uh, achieve that ranking again for the eighth year in a row this year even though there's no passengers going through the place they've um, yeah. they've done it again Singapore and as you say it's the most wonderful place to leave and also come back to because you can get through that airport and get home within literally minutes can't you it's uh yeah and it's, it's amazing like from there even just even if you're not going by by air like to Indonesia by ferry I took I took ferries from Singapore to all kinds of places in Indonesia. Mm. All the a lot of those look like if you don't if you're not headed for a big tourist destination, we would just grab bicycles and go to some of the Indonesian islands just for the day. Yeah. And mountain biking and stuff. Or up into Malaysia, super easy yep. to take trains and stuff up into parts of Malaysia. Yeah. So you're kind of right on the doorstep of some wonderful uh, of wonderful parts of Southeast Asia there. Have you happened to take the train from Singapore up to Bangkok? 
Have you done that? No, no, not the whole way. No, I think I, I know which one you're talking about, but yeah, I haven't. That's an adventure, that one. That's for sure. How long were you in Singapore for? Three years. Three years. I did three years. Three years in in Chicago. Three years in New York. Three years in Singapore, roughly. So three yeah. years is three years is your timeline, is it? Before you get at your feet <laughs> and you got to got to move on again. It was at that age, anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah. So three years, and then. Um, I quit my job. I mm. was thinking actually I was going to become a, a professional sailor right. in terms of a delivery skipper. Mm-hmm. Um, so I I got on a boat and sailed from, uh, you know, left my job and, and got on a boat and sailed from uh, from Malaysia. The boat was in uh, Malaysia. It was it turned into a bit of a nightmare as these things often do when you, when you set off on a poorly planned adventure. <laughs> I'd found this this boat that was supposed to be delivered um, to England from, from, uh, Thailand, I think, and, uh, ended up being the skipper and the owner had a fight that came, nearly came to blows. Um, and the owner was, had, had the owner had, had be, was a, was a wealthy guy who'd had a, a steel replica of Joshua Slocum spray built. Oh, right. So there was a, uh, it was a 60 foot replica. Yeah. And, uh, so he built this thing, and it was when I stepped on board. It was so beautiful down below. There's all these beautiful woods and polished brass and everything. Monogram sheets, wow. uh, <laughs> two bathtubs. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But only a hundred liter water tank. Oh. Okay. <laughs> and no windlass. Right. And right. As we did some research, like this boat was not ready to be delivered from from uh, Southeast Asia to England. Like there was, you know, we, we were like we're going to have to have a windlass on it. Yeah. And uh, it turned into a mo- many months debacle of trying to bring this boat up to up to standard to sail it and in the end uh, we had a falling out with the owner so i went up to phuket and uh found another boat <clears throat> about to leave jumped onto that and sailed with them um across the indian ocean through the red sea across the med yeah. jumped actually switched the boats did kind of boat hopped yeah until uh, i got to uh, turkey now, there'd be plenty of people <coughs> listening to the show today to uh, wanting to know how you go about getting these kinds of adventures under your, your belt. So for somebody that's looking to become a crew on a, on a boat, how do you actually go about it? Excuse me, coughing break. <coughs> Anyone that is wondering how to do something like this, first of all, there's a couple of websites. Uh, I think one's called Crew Saver. Um, another one's called Float Plan. <coughs> Float Plan. Uh, these are websites that you can kind of post. They're like crew wanted and crew available ads. There's others out there as well. Um, it helps to have a skill. You don't have to necessarily be a good sailor. Uh, if you're if you're willing to cook, if you have medical, any kind of like, you know, if you can say you've got first aid or any kind of medical experience, that helps. Uh, if you're a good photographer or when you bring your drone, I'll make you some sexy pictures of your boat. Mm-hmm. Um because often these people, you know, to teach someone to stand watch at night, um, you don't need to, it's not that hard really to teach someone to stand watch, somebody that's fairly responsible and has some aspect or some athletic sort of adventure bone in them. Um, yeah, you have to be able to offer something. Sometimes you pay. Uh, I, there were some boats that I've been on at, at the beginning as I was building up my miles where you'd pay, I don't know. 10, 20 US dollars a day or something like that mm. to help pay for the cost. Mm. Um, but there's tons of boats out there looking for crew like mm. this. It's usually it's usually um, couples who have been racing or sailing around the world and they've been island hopping. And then when they get to the big puddles that they need to get across, and that was the case here, they come up from New Zealand, they come up through all through the islands, and now they were trying to get the boat you know, across the Indian Ocean. And uh, that's where they wanted to have extra hands on deck. Mm. And so that's usually the case. Um, and it's a great great way to do it, great way to get into sailing, great, great way to get some miles. Yeah, exactly. And uh, for those that are listening and watching today, there's lots and lots of cruisers out there that are tripping around the world at the moment. So uh, it's pretty easy to get on a boat, actually. Yeah. Right now, it's probably not a great time. I mean, at, in, at this immediate time, because there's a lot of boats stuck because of COVID. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Once it blows through, then yeah. There's a lot of, yeah. So the Indian Ocean, that's a bit of a gnarly stretch of water. How, how, how did you go across yeah, there? Yeah, that was interesting. So that was in 2004. And that was kind of the peak of the pirate problem off of the Somalian coastline. Right. And uh, so we sailed we sailed on our own until Salala, mm-hmm. Oman. 
And then in Salala, we got together, I think there was about 10 other boats around, around 10 boats altogether maybe, um, that we moved in, in uh, kind of in, in uh, a group down at Convoy, I guess you call it, down the coast. And uh, it was, I mean, it was, it was scary, but nothing happened. But it was just in our heads. I mean, I mean, the threat was real, hmm. but uh, nothing actually happened to us. Um, and we sailed down. Yeah, we went into spent some time in Yemen, mm -hmm. <clears throat> which was interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, Eritrea, uh, and then going up the Red Sea. We spent I think a week or two in Sudan. We never checked in. Um, Sudan, the Sudanese coastline is pretty wild, mm. pretty empty. Mm. Uh, we went ashore a couple places and stuff and met up with some lonely fishermen here and there and stuff, but, uh, worked our way up the Red Sea and through the, through the Suez and then to Turkey. Yeah. Mm. Amazing trip. How long did that take in total from the time you left Asia? Um, three or four months. Yeah. Mm. And then I spent the summer, uh, in England and France, got my RYA uh, offshore yacht master mm -hmm. ticket. Mm -hmm. um, did a lot of sailing, did the fast net, um, and then uh, went it down, flew down to South Africa and jumped on a delivery from spent a, spent a month driving across South Africa. I rented a car, did a did a month of touring through South Africa, and then jumped on a boat. Um, on a yacht delivery, a, a brand new catamaran, a brand new Leopard 40, I believe it was. Oh, nice. Uh, and we delivered it across the Atlantic to the Caribbean. Right. Yeah. Uh, St. Helena in Brazil. Right. Uh, and yeah, it was a great trip. The boat uh, it was, uh, I, I don't know how the quality of Leopards has changed over the years, but uh, being in the southern Atlantic Ocean on a leopard was not particularly an experience I want to repeat. <laughs> right. <laughs> it wasn't really built for that. Uh, but a hobby, but a hobby horsing hobby. going on, was it? It was uh, pulling apart. Yeah, the bulkheads were pulling apart. Oh, dear. Okay. Well, let's hope they've got their quality insurance uh, process sure in place. <laughs> I'm sure they've improved. Yeah, fantastic. So you've so got a lot... An entire year. So that was, by the time I got to Canada, it was an entire year of traveling. You've got a lot to thank those girls in bikinis for on Lake Michigan, haven't you? They really set you off on a journey, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, they did, yeah. So what happened then as far as the career path goes? Because you jumped back into um, getting a real job, didn't you? Yeah, I ended up finding my way back uh, to Asia and came to Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. uh, got into the newspapers here, uh, South China Morning Post, and eventually Financial Times. And uh, because, so I, I got into sailing because I, I thought I wanted to become a delivery skipper. Right. Uh, I thought that'd be a good way to spend the rest, spend some years. And after having spent a year kind of doing it, I mean, some of the, some of the gigs were sort of paid and some, a lot of it was building miles, but I kind of was in that culture and that world. I realized it wasn't what I wanted to do. Right. Uh, I really missed the, the um, intellectual part of writing and research and this sort of thing. And so I decided I would try to find something I could do both at. Uh, and so I came back to Asia, got back into journalism, had to replenish the bank accounts a little bit. Um, and then when I was, I was at, working at the Financial Times and quit that job to sail the Northwest Passage. Mm. Um, mm. I bought a boat, bought an old boat, uh, an old 40-foot fiberglass boat, um, did it all on the sly while I was working full time, <laughs> right. Um, right. all the planning that my friends that were in that, in that job with me still, jo still tease me about it, how they'd come up behind me uh, and see on my screen, I was, you know, researching polar bear insurance and things like this. And, <laughs> and they're like, Oh, is that part of uh, the lead story today, Cameron? You know? <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> so I did all the research was flying to Canada to get the boat surveyed, all this sort of thing on holidays. And uh, <clears throat> finally announced that I was, I was leaving my job and going to the Arctic. And there's nothing like when you quit a job, you know, sometimes you, you, you quit a job and you're like, yeah, we're going to competitor or something. But there's nothing like being able to say, you know, quitting the job. Yeah, I'm, I'm leaving because I want to do an Arctic expedition. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Now, how did that come on the radar? What was the attraction to the Northwest Passage? I read um, Al Gore's Con In Inconvenient Truth. Mm. And um, this was in, so I was kind of thinking about it 2006, 2007, around that time maybe. And, kind of, and then that's that's kind of when the idea took hold. Mm. And uh, I think in 2007 was a few boats made made it through. I think two or three boats made it through the Northwest Passage mm -hmm. that year. And I read about that. 
and I just thought, wow, what a grand adventure. Uh, and there's a story I could tell. Um, and so it kind of went back to this idea that I wanted to sail and do some writing. Yeah. Okay. Just for those that are watching that are not uh, up to speed on the whole sailing in the Northwest patches in particular, it's uh, it's not a guaranteed passageway that you can get through every season because of the clim- climatical. Uh, in fact, it's it's would I be right in saying that it's a quite a rare thing to be able to get through? It was. It's becoming easier because of ice. because of climate because of climate change. Yeah. Mm. Um, so. The year we did it, I think uh, seven boats made it through. I I did it in 2009. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, I mean, Jimmy Cornell, uh, one of the most famous ocean sailors in the world in terms of cruising, he tried it a couple years ago, and he failed at his first first attempt. Mm. And certainly not for lack of knowledge and preparation. He was on a beautiful aluminum boat. Yeah. Uh, um, I was on a beat-up old 40-foot fiberglass boat. Yeah. Uh, so it's a mix, uh, mixture of uh, timing and luck, uh, preparation. I mean, the luck, uh, you'll have better luck if you're well prepared. Mm. Um, and uh, and it's a lot of kind of logistics of, of, of um, watching the weather, watching the ice. Um, and it's sort of like you're... you're you got to wait for doors to open in front of you. You got to wait for the ice to open. When you see it open, you got to move to the next safe spot and then wait for the next stage to open up. Mm. Um, mm. We oh, that's what we were doing because we were we were trying to stay as up there as long as we could. Yeah. And so we we're trying to you know watching the satellite imagery on a daily basis in terms of the ice conditions. Mm. Uh, so it's tricky, and and uh, I, I you know I think we did okay job of it, but I wouldn't you know there was a bit of luck involved as well in getting through in one year. Where did you uh, commence this voyage from? We did it backwards. Well, I mean, in terms of the classic way is going from, from the east coast of North America to the west coast over the top. Uh, we started in Van, in uh, Victoria, British Columbia. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was sort of almost, uh, it came about kind of almost by mistake. I was coming from, from Hong Kong. I looked at boats on the west coast. It was easy to get there from Hong Kong versus flying all the way to the east coast. Um and I had family on the east coast of, or on the west coast of North America, so it was an easy, easier place to kind of stage it and prepare it. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, so that's the way we went. So it's against current and against uh, yeah. prevailing winds. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, and how many crew did you have on that voyage? Uh, between three and four, uh, okay. depending on different parts. Yeah. So we left from Victoria um, up through the between Alaska and Russia, Bering Sea, mm-hmm. um, and then into the ice. And uh, it took us four months and four days. We arrived in Halifax uh, early October. We left on June 6th and arrived in Halifax, I believe it was on October 10th. So you go up past the Aleutian Islands, is it? Um, yeah, you, you go between, cut through the Aleutian Islands, which yeah. we stopped at Dutch Harbor, yeah. then across the Bering Sea, yeah. and then um, kind of weave your way through, through, the, through the islands at the top of Canada. We... We were very privileged to be able to get through Bellet Strait as well, mm-hmm. which is a uh, very, very narrow section of the of the passage. Normally, people go around that and sail some extra miles to get around, instead of going through it. It's very narrow. It has uh, currents of you know five to eight knots, I think. And if you get caught on the wrong side of a current, and there's kind of a, uh, a lot of rocks on both ends, and they get piled up with ice, and so you can kind of get crushed in mm. the belt, belt straight if you're not careful mm. and uh we had quite recent reports from a helicopter that flown over that it was ice free and so we went for it and i think i think by my calculations we were the eighth sailing boat ever in history to make it through there oh right okay amazing well i'm going to yeah. give you a tip today i've got a mate of mine who last summer sailed his laser dinghy around the entire great britain coastline Wow. And he's currently building a wooden boat to go through the Northwest Passage. So oh, wow. stay tuned for that one. He's going to be yeah, uh, yeah. back on the show soon talking about that. So uh, cool. amazing adventure coming up. Good so yeah. tell me your, your love for the sea. And obviously you're very, very passionate about it. How has it grown over the years? What is it about the sea that connects you to it so strongly? I like sailing because it takes you to places that you wouldn't go to if you didn't weren't on a private boat. Um, it's, uh, in 2004, that voyage, you know, we went to places like Yemen and Eritrea, as I mentioned, I mean, you never would go to these places as a tourist. Uh, 
if if you were if you didn't have a boat. Um, <clears throat> Uh, visiting St. Helena in the middle of the South Atlantic. It's an island that you know didn't doesn't have an airport. Uh, you have to either go by a, a ferry that runs from from South Africa every couple of weeks. I think they may have an airport now. I don't know. I know they was talk of putting one on, but you get to go to these places. And then the other part is that when you arrive in them, you arrive by the back door. Uh, if you fly into a country, if you land in the airport. The experience of, of being in the airport, getting in a taxi, and going to your hotel, the first couple hours that you're in that country, really are pretty nondescript. Hmm. Uh, I mean, yes, airports are a bit different, and taxis are a bit different and stuff, but really, for a, you know, if you're a seasoned traveler, uh, that whole sort of landing, getting into a taxi, getting to the airport, it's a pretty sort of standard procedure. Hmm. When you arrive on a boat in a place like Yemen, they don't have a yacht club. <laughs> you know, you, you you tie up next to the the coastal shipping floatsome. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's some pretty rough characters, some pretty rough ships. Yeah, and you tie up, you know, you raft up to them, and when you're hunting for fuel, you're you know you're walking down the the pier asking these guys who sell fuel to big ships to siphon some off into cans for you. Um, you're buying your groceries in the super, you know, not in the supermarket, but in the open market. Um, that whole experience of arriving in a country, A, that you may never have gone to otherwise if you weren't on a boat, and B, arriving through this, like what I call like, the back door or the kitchen door, kind of like, you often in these under underdeveloped uh, countries, you know, they don't have these beautiful yacht clubs where they're waiting for you and holding, waiting for you when you throw your lines ashore, you know, they're not there. Yeah, uh, yeah. And I love that. I love that part of it. And it's it's frustrating because sometimes you spend days, you know, pounding the pavement in these towns trying to find, you know, uh, some bit of equipment that you need or a, a seal or a, a, a bearing that you have to replace on one of your pumps or something. Um, but that's all part of the fun in my my view. Hmm. It's not always fun right then, but it's it seems fun in hindsight. Yeah, you're right. I, I guess when a lot of us arrive in a country, we get the sanitized approach to going in through an airport. As you say, when you're checking in, though, to, uh, via a yacht or a, a seaborne vessel, it's a different process. Um, you know, your communication skills go to another level immediately, right? And also... Yeah, and and uh, I would also add to that your patience level gets tested out on a number of occasions as well. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. I remember. I think it was in um, I think it was in Sri Lanka, where we the official came on board and was checking the boat, and uh, of course they asked for a gift uh, to help clear every all the papers if, they, if we didn't have a gift for them. And uh, again, seasoned cruisers know to carry a, you know cartons of cigarettes and and. <laughs> stock up on cheap bottles of rum where you find it and stuff like this because this is what the officials like to get as gifts yeah and uh, so we had you know cartons of knockoff marlboros and stuff like this that we brought from asia and uh gave the gave the official uh you know a couple packs of ciggies and he goes oh he goes uh, my brother smokes too <laughs> of course he does yeah <laughs> yeah, and so and there, no one will ever tell you that. No one just stamping your passport in the airport will ever ask for that. Will yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, let's hope not. Yeah, it could change the world as we know it today. So you got into the um, what is it? Explorers Club in New York. How does one become a member of the Explorers Club in New York City? Yeah, um, you get nominated. Uh, I did so when I did the Northwest Passage. I wrote a book about it and mm. made a film. Mm -hmm. and and um, so the, the focus of that trip was very much to look at how climate change was impacting Inuit and northern cultures and communities. Mm -hmm. And so we spent quite a bit of time interviewing people and trying to dig into this a little bit. And, uh, and the Explorers Club uh, recognizes adventurers who, I don't know, I can't remember the exact phrase, but basically adventurers who try to further science and knowledge and understanding. Right, okay. And, uh, and so they, yeah, they recognized me for that, for the, for the effort I'd made in the, in the Northwest Passage. Okay. And um, uh, I got elected in. Yeah, you, you can't, uh, you have to get nominated and elected. You can't, 
you can't walk up and put your money on the bar. Yeah, fantastic. So if you are watching this episode and listening, uh, which I know that many people around the world are going to, we have uh, listeners in over 110 countries, Cameron. So there's going to be uh, lots of people listening to you today. I'm going to put all the links to Cameron's adventures in the show notes today. So you can check it all out, um, in particular the films that he's done and the books that he's written. And, uh, and chase up with Cameron as well and give him your support wherever you possibly can. So where does this Explorers Club hang out? Has it got an official address somewhere? Yeah, yeah. So they have a, they have a beautiful clubhouse up on the, um, in Manhattan, mm. uh, Upper East Side, and um, 72nd Street, I believe it is. And um, I'd never been to the club um, until, so fast forward, well, I'll, I'll jump ahead a little bit. We, we might want to go back and tell some stories in between. But I, I, when, I, when I decided to do this motorcycle trip through the Americas, um, the uh, Explorers Club said they, uh, you can apply and you can become a flag carrier. Uh, and they have these wonderful old faded flags and they're all numbered. And they've been on tons of expeditions and mine had been on 50 some expeditions already by the time they sent it to me. And so basically you carry this flag and you represent the club on your expedition and, and it sort of um, gives them your, uh, g- they give you a little you know, stamp of approval. And, um, and that's a great honor to, to be able to carry, carry a club flag. Mm. And so in order to pick up this club flag, when I did my motorcycle trip, um, my motorcycle, the, the point of my motorcycle trip was to ride through the Americas and research my Mennonite culture. Right. Um, and so I drove from Manitoba, where I'm, my family is based, and that's where I bought my motorcycle and got, got everything set up. I drove to New York and to pick up this flag. And also, because I'd lived in New York and I had mates in New York, I wanted to go there and and it was kind of cool riding around New York and through Times Square with my bike and stuff. And, yeah. And so I got to the club, and uh, <clears throat> they they you know told the recep gave the receptionist my name, and they were expecting me, and they came down with, with the flag, and you know we you know, posed for some pictures in front of the club. It's this beautiful you know stone building and everything, and had my motorcycle there, and you know uh, took the pictures with the with the president of the club and all this sort of thing, and then. Uh, I said, well, I'd love to, I hadn't been inside yet. I said, I'd love to see the club. I said, I've, I've been a member for a few years. I've never been inside because I live in Hong Kong. Yeah. Oh, well, you know, let's give you a tour. <laughs> and so I left my bike just parked in front of the club. It was kind of on the, it, it was on the sidewalk, but <laughs> kind of on the front apron part of the club. <clears throat> and as we walked in, they told the receptionist, just keep an eye on his bike because I had my helmet on it and stuff. They said, just keep an eye on it. Yeah. And, uh, and so we were up on like the, it's a, it, there's, there's all these rickety wooden stairs that go up through the club, and we were on the, I don't know what, third, fourth floor, uh, looking at a pair of Abmanson's underwear or something. You know, like they've got, it's just amazing. They've got cupboards full of, of all the artifacts from different expeditions and the clothing and the maps and the diaries and log books. I mean, it's just astounding. Right. And we were looking, digging around through all this musty stuff, and, and uh, because I'd been to the Arctic, I was very keen to see some of the Arctic uh, explorer things. And suddenly we hear this, you know, <clears throat> the receptionist calling up the stairs, uh, Mr. Duick, Mr. Duick. And so we went running down and uh, the receptionist was trying to hold back a, a New York policewoman who was writing a ticket <laughs> right. on my bike. And, uh, and so the president, he's like, oh, no, no, you know, he's a club member. We were just doing a little ceremony to thank. She's like, do you have a license to do a ceremony on a public sidewalk? <laughs> And he was like, well, no, no. She was like, well, you know, and so this back and forth went on. And she was quite a, she, the, the, the police woman had a, had a, had a lot of attitude. Right. And uh, she couldn't be dissuaded. And so she uh, wrote out a $215 parking oh, ticket. Oh, <laughs> welcome to the Explorers Club. Yeah. And so I never did pay it. I just left. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, it was a little souvenir. Still have it. There you go. So uh, how many members are there of this Explorers Club? I couldn't tell you. Sorry, I, I don't know. It wouldn't be sure too many, I would I would think. wouldn't be too many. Uh, no, I mean, it, no. It's, it's a limited number, yeah. Mm, mm. Okay, cool. So you talked about motorcycle. Now, I brought my first motorcycle when I was 45 years old and decided to ride it across Asia, but you went a little bit further and decided to go the length of America. What, first of all, as a as a bike nerd, what kind of motorcycle did you buy to do the trip? 
You're going to be very disappointed as a bike nerd. Uh, I bought a Kawasaki KLR650. Oh, dear. Okay. It's a very simple, uh, for anybody that doesn't know motorcycles, it's a very simple, uh, often considered very crude motorcycle, uh, single cylinder, uh, quite heavy for its power output, um, but very reliable, uh, renowned for its reliability and sturdiness. Mm. And uh, I, I, so my plan was to ride from Canada to the tip of South America. And I wanted something I I could fix them on my on my own on the road. Mm. That was one thing I'd learned already by then that uh, if you have a boat or a car or a bike, and you're going to far flung places, uh, you're going to be miles ahead if you can repair it yourself or find parts along the way. Yeah. And so my research told me that uh, KLR was would be good for that. Right. Okay. Fair so, enough. Yeah. And so and also it's carbureted uh, yeah. instead of fuel injection. And yep. so. It means you can push a lot of dirty fuel through it. Yeah, right. Um, and uh, places I went through, I was buying fuel out of bottles beside the road and stuff. And so it was. A, I think it was a good decision for that. Yeah. Um, so why sure. motorbike? What 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 was the? I know the reason why the trip, but why did you choose motorcycle as the form of transportation? It's the best way to immerse yourself in a place if you're traveling overland uh, and you want to cover great distances. In with within a reasonable time. I mean, I spent eight months on the road, covering forty five thousand kilometers. Um, you you can smell the cooking fires. Uh, you can hear the children yelling at you from beside the road. You can feel the heat and the cold and the rain. You're completely immersed in your environment, um, and yet you can. And people find you much more approachable than if you're in a car as well. Like they'll come and talk to you and stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, so you're in the middle of everything, yet you can cover you know hundreds of kilometers every day if you want. Mm. Oh. And so that's the appealing bit. I've always said to everybody who asks the question that your senses come alive when you ride a motorcycle. Yeah, they and, have to be, or else they'll get killed. <laughs> yeah, and, and yeah, and that's true. And that's the other thing is uh, you know you hear all these people talking about living in the now. I don't think I've lived any closer to the now than being on a motorcycle because you you're totally in that zone at the time aren't you you have to be yeah yeah, yeah. cool there's a reason why your mother doesn't want you to buy a motorcycle <laughs> yeah. they, they are bloody dangerous and there's I a reason uh, there's a reason i didn't tell her when i brought mine <laughs> <laughs> uh they're they're very dangerous but uh they're wonderful machines to to see the world in Tell us about the exploration to uncover the roots of Mennonites. What, what was what was the uh, driving force behind that? So Mennonites, uh, as an in introduction, is a um, cultural religious group, mm -hmm. Germanic in its roots, um, Christian, um, came out of the Protestant movement in the 1500s, um, quite strict, uh, conservative, very much uh, agriculturally based, Rural rural communities uh, tend to be prefer to remain isolated and remain in their own communities and build their own communities. And so Mennonites have a history of moving from country to country, uh, creating communities in isolated areas, and then remaining sort of culturally ethnically isolated. Mm -hmm. um, and so I grew up in a Mennonite community in in Manitoba. My family came from Russia in the in 1874. Mm. Um, and so we're originally, the, the, the culture originally comes from uh, the lowlands and Friesland uh, areas of, of Netherlands and Germany. Mm -hmm. um, and since my family came to Canada in 1874, Mennonites have continued to move uh, on, pushed by two key factors. One is a constant search for farmland, because mm -hmm. they tend to have big families and all the boys want to be farmers. Mm -hmm. And so they're always looking for more farmland. And the other thing is that they, um, that the Mennonites are always looking for places where they can live isolated from broader society. So when, in, 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 they'll move to a country and often they'll negotiate sort of a, it's called a privilegium, kind of a deal where, you know, you, you'll leave us alone if we pay our taxes and, you know, run our own schools and everything. But you'll, there's the, the Mennonites tend to strike these sort of deals with governments. And usually... It's a government that is in a developing country or trying to, do, you know, when they moved to Canada, Canada was just becoming a nation, needed farmers, so they struck a deal with the Canadian government. Eventually, as the Canadian government, <clears throat> as the country became a nation, uh, national laws and so forth, 
then the Mennonites started losing some of their autonomy. Mm -hmm. So they moved south. Mm -hmm. Mexico, Belize, Bolivia, Paraguay. And it's not a perfectly linear immigration route going south, but the Mennonites have spread all through the Americas. Right. And they tend to live in colonies where they own land uh, adjacent and in one big tract of land. And some of these colonies have 50, 80,000 people on them. Wow. Okay. Um, or the regions of not a separate, not each colony, but in some of these countries, there's 50, 80,000 Mennonites. And, yeah. and so the colonies can be quite large. Yep. Uh, and they run their own hospitals, their own schools, their own, you know, supply chains, everything. Mm. So they're kind of like micro states in these different countries. Mm. And most of the Mennonites in Latin America have Russian, came via the Russian immigration path that my family did. And there's, like I say, the Mennonite immigration path is not perfectly linear. So I was trying to research Mennonites who might have come in the same wave that my great grandfather did mm -hmm. and then moved on to Latin America because mm -hmm. these are really my people and some of them are my relatives. You know? I was going to say, yeah, did you run into yeah. any family yeah. members down the, down the tree? Yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, so that was the purpose. I rode motorcycle through all these different countries, <clears throat> zigzagging, spending time in Mennonite colonies, uh, and just getting to know them and interviewing them and, and uh, ended up writing a book about it. Yeah. Incredible. Any um, scary moments on the bike where you thought it was <laughs> nearly to be over? Yeah, yeah, many. I mean, I had two significant crashes. Um, one of them was in Brazil. I uh, ran into the back of a pickup truck at Ooh. highway speed. Mm. That got pretty ugly. Uh, and another one in Uruguay uh, where I wiped out. Um, and, I mean, I came off my bike so many times, I, I can't count. I mean, out of 45,000 kilometers of riding, I reckon I did about 10,000 dirt. <laughs> right. um, and so, I, if I, when I'd be looking at the, at the maps, if I could find a dirt road that would get me there rather than tarmac, yeah. uh, I always did dirt. Right. Um, and so, all, in, in South America, it's brilliant for that. Like, you can cross huge areas riding just rough dirt, gravel, rock, roads yeah um through bolivia and places like that you know um really tried to stay on the dirt if i could yeah. just because it's just more fun yeah more fun riding better camping i did a lot of wild camping yeah i uh, just ride until i'd find a creek with a shady tree and go that'd be a nice place to put my tent and yeah. spend the night there fantastic um and so yeah it was an absolutely brilliant adventure uh got to the darien gap between panama and colombia mm-hmm Loaded the bike onto a sailboat, mm -hmm. onto a catamaran, mm -hmm. uh, strapped it to the deck, <laughs> right. and uh, sailed to Colombia. <laughs> um, rode uh, across the uh, Sala de Uni, the big salt flats in salt in, flats. in, mm -hmm. in, uh, in Bolivia. Yep. Uh, went up to Machu Picchu. Yep. Um, Crisscrossed between the Atlantic and the the Pacific. Uh, I believe it was eight times overall. Mm. Uh, obviously, in South, in Central America, it got easier. It was zigzag between the two, but yeah. uh, dipped my toes in each ocean multiple multiple times. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, just covered a lot of ground. But at the same time, it was very interesting because the the journey really was it was a journey of very much two two aspects in terms of there was this riding solo, mostly solo riding. I had a friend join me for a couple of months in Central America, mm -hmm. but most of it was solo. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a beautiful thing, but also a bit of a lonely thing sometimes. Yep. And, and it's never lonely when you're in the countryside, but then you arrive in the city and go for, you know, get scrubbed up and find, you know, dig a clean pair of jeans out and go for dinner. And then you're sitting in a restaurant by yourself. By yourself, and, yeah. 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 And you're like, oh, this, you know, it would be nice to have a friend here. <laughs> yeah. Um, and all that adventure of riding and breakdowns and, you know, <clears throat> fixing your bike beside the road and all this sort of stuff. But then the other side of it was this very deep, um, emotional uh, kind of identity related search for this culture and, and these trying to find my ties to this culture. I, mean, I left the Mennonite community as a 20 year old mm -hmm. and have been living overseas in all these different countries and then coming back to it and as a journalist you know, you're always interviewing people who are different than you or have a different story than you or you're trying to learn something from them but it was sort of, I was interviewing people to find a story that I kind of knew. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I was trying to find my connection to the story again yeah. and, and find my, see myself in that identity that they were describing. And so there's this very interesting balance between this time on the road and then I dive into these communities and spend a couple of weeks at a time, sometimes surrounded by Mennonites, 
eating the foods I grew up with, speaking Plattdeutsch, which is like a, a German dialect, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, speaking this language, and, and you know, being surrounded by people who were like the people, like my grandma. You know, they, it felt very homely. Uh, and then when I'd sort of be done with that, then I'd jump back on my bike and spend a few weeks banging around the mountains by myself again and and having time to kind of process all this. Because when you're on a bike, yes, you're focused on the riding, but you also have a lot of time to think, um, especially when you're you know riding 45,000 kilometers alone. Uh, there's a lot of time with just you and your helmet. And um, so it was an interesting, a very, very uh, introspective trip in that sense. It sounds both uh, therapeutic as well as spiritual in terms yes. of the reflection uh, that you had, but also having this connection, as you say, to the cause that you were, you were going after. What was the conclusion of it, other than the book? Um, mm. what, was it, what was the conclusion for you personally from that trip? That identity is a very complicated thing. Mm -hmm. It's a very personal thing, mm -hmm. uh, cultural identity, um, that... I mean, I'm a I'm a I'm a white English-speaking straight male. That should that should be you know I, I don't naturally have a very interesting cultural story to tell from from an Anglo-Saxon Western perspective, uh, but I do I do have an interesting story. I do have an interesting family story to tell. I mean, yeah. we all have stories to tell. We all have very interesting stories to tell. Yeah. Um, and so this idea of identity that you also pick and choose. It doesn't matter if you you're you're a mix of of you know Caribbean and Chinese or whatever you might be. Um, you pick and choose which bits of the culture you call your own, and the rest can sometimes almost be like a weight mm. on you. Mm. It can be an obligation, mm. and there's an interesting balance between that where you the bits you choose to own, the bits you're proud of, and the bits that you can't get away from. And sometimes there's bits that you just can't relate to. Uh, and yet, from the outside, everybody would say, oh, that's you. That's all you. And But we know that, well, actually, you know, I, I pick and choose out of that identity, which is mine. Um, and it's a very nuanced thing. It's a very private thing. Um, but I think it's an important thing, especially in this, in this day and age when uh, cross-culture, multiculturalism, uh, mixed culture, uh, kids, you know, so many of us, now are, are born to families that are multiracial or multicultural or have grown up in a country that is not our native culture. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we're, our identities, our cultural identities have become far more complex. Yep. And um, it's, I think, important to consider these things and how do we deal with that complexity of cultural identity and how do we kind of own that, own our own cultural identity, even if it doesn't necessarily match what people on the outside might see it as yeah great points I, I wanted to ask you as a result of that and listening to you talking about that journey that you've been on um what have you learned about yourself that i'm mennonite <laughs> right um, what does that mean I, to you that the that despite all the years of traveling around the world and taking a very different path than most of the people in my family that there are parts of me that I can very clearly identify as cultural traits that remain from when I grew up, from the culture I grew up in. Um, that you can never quite shake the set, shake the dust off your feet, if you want to put it that way. I guess. Mm. And I mean that in a very positive way. I'm very, very proud of my Mennonite culture, especially after having done this, this journey and, and this book. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, w I was surprised to find bits of Mennonite. I was, I, was, I was surprised to find parts of, my, of who I am and realize that they were related to my Mennonite culture. Mm -hmm. mm. There are bits of me that I, I, I'd always recognized and knew that was part of my character, and, but realizing that the environment I grew up in and the environment, I, the culture I came from, probably had a pretty big role in that. Mm. And um, because I wouldn't say that my my life was spent running away from my Mennonite culture, but I've certainly immersed myself in a world that was very different than my Mennonite culture. And I think in that act of moving around the world and having this career and traveling, that I sometimes thought that that uh, well, I'm certainly not very Mennonite anymore, you know, and that I was incorrect. Mm. Uh, I'm still very Mennonite. Yeah. And I think that most of us would find that if 
especially if you grow up in a quite a per- particular, quite a specific culture, uh, religious, perhaps a religious culture. I think that a lot of people that have left that um, maybe think that they don't that m- not much of that is left in them. Yeah. And I think that if you dig into it, you find that actually there's a lot of positive things still, and maybe sometimes negative things too. Yeah. Yeah. They say you never leave home, right? Truly. So. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So what about your um, take on humanity? You've been traveling around the world and under all these different guises and been to lots of incredible places, some that you've lived in, others that you've visited for a short period of time. What's your take on humanity? What's it all about? Well, we are all the same. We are all the same. Um, Everybody wants the same things. They want to be safe. They want to raise their kids in a safe environment. They want enough to eat. Um... And uh, if you can get beyond the differences in language and skin color and accents and the way we dress, um, you start seeing how similar we are. Mm. And uh, I think, um, yeah, that's my take. And also, like what I said earlier about when you're traveling, you know, people are good. People are generally, people want to be good. People, you know, most people want to want to help others. Mm. And when you're traveling alone through foreign countries, you really realize that. And again, I'm not, I don't, I'm not naive. I've traveled enough not to be naive. I know there are people out there who want to harm you as well, mm. uh, that want to take advantage of your vulnerability and steal from you or hurt you. Mm. But they're vastly in the minority. Mm. And uh, and so, yeah, I mean, I guess. It, I guess that's my my takeaway. If we could just get rid of all these rotten leaders we have, because <laughs> um, in the real in the, in reality, people want to be good to each other. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to ask you about that actually before we finish up today, because it, it's uh, I think you're the first journalist I've had on the show. Perhaps you are, um, but obviously the other ones didn't leave a good impression if they were journalists. So. So what's your take on the world of journalism at the moment? Like, There's so much going on, um, and, and I'm not just talking about COVID, of course. I'm talking about everything in the world at the moment. What's your take on journalism and the stance of where journalists are at at the moment? Well, first of all, the caveat, I, I'm not a practicing journalist anymore. I, okay. I was a journalist for many years. I'm, I'm still a writer. Even better uh, still, not, you can tell us the truth then. <laughs> but I, I, don't work in, I don't work in news journalism at the moment. But um, I think it's hard because I think what we need is real in-depth investigative journalism right now. Um, with the information age, the basic information is really easy to get. Mm. The, the, day, the news of the day, I don't think uh, is, 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 it's not as hard to, it's not as hard to produce and to, to disseminate as it was, you know, 30 years ago. Mm. But what we need more than ever is the, the stories that help us understand the news and help us understand the events and that means the more in-depth stories that means digging because with with the greater availability of the superficial news at the same time there's been a huge push to 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 hide the real truth sometimes and there's uh and so and because the news business has been turned on its head in terms of economics um it's tends to be, you know, the news business is being fed this dribble of daily news and superficial stuff, and it doesn't really have the financial resources to dig below that very often. A lot of news organizations, because investigative journalism is bloody expensive. Mm. It takes months Mm. of highly skilled, your most expensive journalists, your most expensive photographers need to spend months traveling on planes and investigating and often chasing down leads that turn to nothing. And that's very expensive. And nowadays, news organizations aren't making money. And so they tend to go for the cheaper stuff, which is the daily news, which is easier to do. So I think it's, I think it's troubling. I, I, um, I feel terrible for, for um, journalists out there who see these stories they want to dig into and can't because the organizations don't have the funding to pay for it. I mean, there are still a few that do, mm. uh, and, and I applaud that, and I wish that was, there was more of that. And I think... I think what's going to happen eventually is that the industry is going to kind of split down these two ways where you have the daily news. <coughs> Excuse me. I think the industry is going to split down these two ways where you kind of have this daily news uh, surface stuff and then there's going to be 
organizations that are committed more more to the deeper stuff. I don't I don't know. I, I, I don't know much about the news business economically, but that's how it seems to me. I'd like to share an opinion I have on this because I, I, I like uh, anything that's disruptive in a positive sense and I'm seeing that and since I've become part of the podcast network um, I'm finding that there's an enormous amount of growth in this sector uh, if you look at people like Joe Rogan who's a, a bit of an idol within the podcasting world he's able to entertain an audience of over three or four million people per show uh, where he sits down for up to three hours four hours with his guests uh, having real authentic raw deep conversations and I, I think this goes back to the point you were making people are hungry I think today for authentically deep conversations with each other again about real topics that matter to all of us and this kind of charade that's going on with the 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 news networks with you know all these dramatic stories that are coming out every day people are sick and tired of it and i think people are hungry to get in that and i think the podcasting world has not only relaunched the opportunities that exist for anybody a guy sitting on a boat in the middle of nowhere doing a show talking to people about really deep meaningful things i think there's a real future in that would you agree yeah i definitely think so i think uh and especially on the investigative thing what i was saying before i know in australia i can't remember their names i know you've had a couple of podcasters that have dug up some uh, cold case murder uh, yeah, yeah. stories and that's and that's happening elsewhere as well um that kind of thing where it's maybe not driven by economics always. Mm -hmm. uh, some, so I think some of these, a lot of these podcasts, uh, maybe become become financially viable over time, but are begun out of just a passion. Um, and the beauty of the of the internet and beauty of, of of social media is that these sort of niche topics can suddenly find their audience, um, where before that was could be quite difficult to do, and that's where this mass sort of news model came from because it was like we got to feed something we got to produce something that everybody wants to see mm. and now we are in this kind of world where we're like well we can produce something high quality that maybe not everybody wants to see but the people that do want to see it really want to see it yeah and they'll pay for it yeah um so yeah no i agree i think i think the here in hong kong there's an interesting aspect to that the government has just introduced a uh, sort of a uh licensing system for media for journalists okay you need to have a, a press card, mm -hmm. and they're not issuing them. There, there's some debate now, and and, and back and forth, and, and uh, they don't want to issue them to sort of citizen journalists. And I think this is a big mistake because this is the direction in which, as you pointed out, this is the direction in which journalism is going. It's everybody with a everybody with a mobile phone. Anybody that has a has a hand phone, uh, a smartphone, can be a journalist. Yep. Um, there are downsides to that. I off, when blogging came into into vogue, mm. I often said blogging is not the same as being a journalist because being a journalist means that you're writing under uh, writing under a name, whether it's New York Times or such China Morning Post or The Guardian. They have a reputation to protect, and there's a whole desk full of people who are going to look at your story, question your story, double check it, and make sure that you're being accurate. I, I still feel that a little bit, mm -hmm. but I do feel that I feel that uh, blogging and 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 podcasting has come into its own now. Um, I do think that in terms of there's still a lot of value towards that fact checking and and the reputation. When you're a journalist for a newspaper, you you represent that newspaper, and so there's a responsibility not only to the truth to your readers, but you're also you're 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 being checked on. Uh, and I think some of the independent journalism doesn't have that. Mm. And I think that's something we have to recognize. And I don't know if it's necessarily something we need to correct or not, but it's something we need to recognize. Yeah. Um, but it's interesting here in Hong Kong. So like I say, they, they don't want to give licenses to these independent journalists. And, and during the protests here, they played a very important role. They captured a lot of video yep. of things happening that the police and the government didn't want to be have seen. Yeah. Uh, and because every, you know lurking behind every tree was someone with a mobile phone. Mm. And and all they need to do is take that and go to one of the you know and some of them had their own websites or whatever and <clears throat> and I think that's important in these days when overwhelmingly power is being abused uh, in most of the countries <clears throat> that we have always considered sort of the free bastions of democracy power is being abused mm. I think the press is more important than ever yeah and I think as you point out the podcasters the citizen journalists have a very very important role to play 
and I, and I think also I I understand your concerns around the the credibility to behind some of these, and I think what's going to happen is the law of the jungle is going to operate again, where those that are really um, putting the efforts in, and you see with people like again, I'll use Joe Rogan as an example. Um, he's built his own credible following based on. Um, doing it for a long period of time he wasn't an overnight success you know he's yeah. paid his dues and he's hustled and he's and he's kept the show going and what I found in the podcast world you know if you've done probably more than a hundred shows you you get a little bit of credibility associated with that because it's not an easy thing to do sitting in front of a microphone and getting the guests and yeah. organizing everything and going through that process but what I find fascinating is you know I could talk to you today and tomorrow I could have someone like Elon Musk on the show um, who who last week did a 60 minutes interview on a cable network show in America right so it gives us the ability to get to those types of people if they want to share their story with a different audience which they want to do and you see people like him um, as an example Elon Musk who, who jumps on a lot of random podcast shows to talk about SpaceX and everything else because he knows he's going to get to another audience right and I find that really yeah. fascinating about it as well and i think also so for speaking as an author mm. uh, and someone who you know not i'm not a best-selling author i've written two books and and they're books very much on topics driven by my own passion my own personal interest um the 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 publishing world and the world that supports the publishing world the the, the press the 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 marketing is very much driven for and by the best sellers. Uh, it's, and this is the same for music, it's the same for theater, it's the same for film, it's the same for any kind of creative um, expression, I think, that you know, the, the mass market, is, there's a few people that make it, and the vast majority of writers and musicians can't support themselves with their, purely with their creative efforts. The democratization of the media is good for us as well mm. because I, I you know I can't get on 60 minutes mm. um, and uh, there's and I've done a few podcasts now and and the the, the democratization means that um, it's breaking up that that pyramid a little bit I think yeah. I think that's good yeah I think that's good because I think I think my voice deserves to be heard I think and I think there's been, you know everybody else all the all the musicians out there that are you know fantastic musicians but don't have aren't getting radio play or whatever just you know Spotify has done it for them right yep in a way you know I've discovered so many bands I've never heard of before uh, through Spotify um, which there's a pricing model there that could be just debated as well but this idea of the democratization it matches a little bit um, with the the, the product availability, I think. I think we also got to get away from this whole um, bestseller list and all the rest of it as being a ranking system or a benchmark that's used to, to um, you know, I guess to generalize people's achievements because I... I went through a random process the other day and I can actually become a bestseller on Amazon and after selling only three copies of my book so <laughs> what does that yeah. tell us right so I, yeah. I think people got to look deeper than that as well and and I think by having these alternative platforms allows us to get to a, a new audience Cameron what's next you're sitting in a place in Hong Kong it seems to be the worst place for a guy like you who should be out on the <laughs> high, high seas bouncing around in the trade winds so what's next on your exploration and bucket list um, I'm I'm in the midst of so my girlfriend and I bought a uh, a sailboat mm. um, and a uh, Halberg Rossi 42. I'm very proud of her. Yeah. Um, she needs a bit of TLC. We're bringing her back to life. Yeah. Um, and uh, because of COVID, we're just kind of hunkered down and working. We both uh, found jobs uh, and are just working and kind of re replenishing the kitty for the moment. Yeah. Spending a lot of money on the boat, right. uh, upgrading <laughs> it, putting toys on the boat. Yeah. And yeah, we're kind of just waiting um, for the timing to be right, and then we want to set off, and we're sort of planning to do a, a multi-year cruise, and we're not sure, um, well, we have some ideas where we want to go, yeah. and what we want to do. This time, we're looking at combining citizen science right. with our sailing adventure, yep. uh, talking to Hong Kong University about installing some monitoring equipment on the boat, right. uh, and doing various sampling and stuff like this, uh, because we like the idea of contributing data to to science, um, mm. like the idea of, of playing a role in that, and so that's the next thing. Yeah, we're. I think the the COVID thing, uh, it's a good time just to kind of hang tight and just let things play out a little bit, and then uh, by then our boat will be ready to go, 
and uh, we, we sail there every weekend. So we, Hong Kong, most people don't realize this, Hong Kong is a brilliant place to sail. Is it? Tons of wonderful cruising. We just came back from a nine-day cruising trip in right. Hong Kong waters. Right. And we've done this We've done this three times now. Yeah. And we still have a lot of places we haven't explored that we want to explore. Ah, right. Yeah. There's all these islands and bays and, and, wonder, and little villages and a lot of great hiking. So you, you know, dinghy ashore and go on wonderful hikes. And yeah. And seafood restaurants tucked into little corners and... And out in the rural areas, it's beautiful. And so uh, we've been sailing a lot, testing the boat, getting her ready, and uh, itching to go, definitely. <laughs> but uh, trying to be patient and knowing that there's a great journey coming up ahead. Well, fantastic. Look, I'd love to have you back on the show at a, at a later date to update us on your voyages and what you've been up to, because I'm sure that a lot of the listeners listening in today have been fascinated by your life journey thus far and uh, want to keep up to date with it. So if you'd love to come back on the show, I'd love to have you back again and uh, we can talk about where you're at. Definitely would love to. Next time I'll be on a boat as well. <laughs> Who knows? We might be able to do a live one uh, uh, cocktails at sunset somewhere in the world. Yeah, we can raft up. <laughs> Cameron, thanks very much for being on the Humanity Podcast show today. Have a brilliant day, and uh, thanks again for your time. Cheers. Thanks for having me.